I'm Jim Page, fly fishing for the rest of us. So you had enough of winter, or you're still in winter? You want to head south to Florida? You got spring break coming up? Or are you just sick of the snow and cold? Um, I don't blame you. My wife and I just got back from a two-week trip in Florida, so I thought I'd put together a video since I grew up an hour north of Florida and uh, lived in the Panhandle and fished all over Florida from Jacksonville down through the Keys back up around all the way through the Panhandle. I thought I'd put together a video of things you need to take when you go to Florida as far as fly fishing. And there are some things that are specific to different areas in Florida that you will need when you go down there. So let's go through uh, some basic items that you're gonna need. So first thing is a fly rod and fly reel. Um, if you have a five weight, a six weight, a seven weight, an eight weight, a nine weight, a 10 weight, whatever fly rod you have, take. If all you have is a five weight, that's fine. If all you have is an eight weight, that's fine. If you have multiple fly rods, I recommend taking something heavier and lighter, say like a five and eight, a five and nine, a six and nine, a six and eight, a seven and nine. We talked about on earlier videos that the good first rod for you is a, for anyone getting into fly fishing is a five weight and a second good rod is a nine weight and that third rod to round out your collection is a seven weight. You can do the same thing with a six, eight, ten weight or a four, six, eight weight. But I always try to take two rods with me whether I'm traveling on a plane or whether I'm traveling in car in case one breaks. I still have one to fish with. But if you don't have two, if you have one, take it. But if you can take like a five and an eight or a four and an eight or a six and a nine or a five and a nine, take both of them if you can. So let's talk about it. So you've got your fly rods, say a five and a nine or a seven and a nine. So what lines? Generically, you can go to Florida and fish a weight forward floating line for 90% of your fishing. There are times when you're going to be fishing deep channels between uh, islands or cuts through the flats where you might want an intermediate sink line, but you really don't need that if you don't have it. If you have one, take it. If you don't have one, I don't think you'd necessarily need to go buy one. You can cover deeper water by going with a longer leader, say a 12 foot leader versus a six or a nine foot leader. So you got a weight forward floating line, you've got your fly rod, you got your fly reel. So next I'm gonna talk in a little bit about flies. So on a previous video, I talked to you a little bit about, here's the flies I always take with me anywhere I go saltwater fishing. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more specific about Florida and the different parts of Florida. Um, some things you need no matter where you go in Florida. You need deceivers. Oh, sorry, that's a clouser. My bad. You need deceivers, chartreuse and white, solid white, white and gray. A chartreuse and white deceiver works everywhere. It works for snook, it works for sea trout, it works for largemouth bass. Um, it's just a good color combination. Like I said, you can use chartreuse and white if you're down in the Everglades, on the west side of the Everglades, which would be Naples through Chocolasco Island, Everglades City. You might want to go with just a solid white deceiver or a white with a gray back. They eat a lot of um, white baits on the west side of the Everglades. If you're Nokomis, Tampa, Nokomis, Venice, Sarasota, that southwest corner headed down to Naples, um, you'll catch a lot of snook, especially at night around the lights on a chartreuse and white um, deceiver. It's a good fly. Take it to the Panhandle, take it to Jacksonville, take it about anywhere. Um, you can also take this not only in white, in white and chartreuse, but solid black. So if you get blown off the water one day, if it's too windy to fish salt water, a solid black deceiver or a black and purple deceiver is great for largemouth bass in Florida. And don't overlook going freshwater fishing while you're in Florida. Um, they've had some water quality issues in the salt water. And sometimes the wind blows 30 miles an hour and it's too rough to go for saltwater fishing. So you gotta go freshwater fishing. So a deceiver in black is also a good color to take with you. It's also a good tarpon fly. Now, next fly, clousers. The one thing about clousers, you really don't need that many color clousers in Florida. Chartreuse and white works everywhere. It'll work for tarpon, redfish, snook, sea trout, um, Jack Carvel. It works for everything in Florida. You can also go with, if you're in a tannic 
situation. Tannic would be water that looks like freshly brewed iced tea. It's brown, but it's clear. When you look at it, you can look down through it two or three feet, but it has a brown tint to it. Now, that's not like murky water that looks like coffee with cream. And you look into it and you can, can't see anything but brown. So a great color combination for tannic water is tan and brown. This one's got a little ginger in the middle. But a clouser that's tan and brown, I've caught redfish, I've caught flounder, caught sea trout. That is a great color combination, especially in the panhandle of Florida, which would be Panama City, um, Cape, Sam, Cape San Blas, uh, Apalachicola, over to Destin, San Destin, Fort Walton, Pensacola. In the spring, sometimes they get really heavy rains. And when that rain comes down out of the woods, down the freshwater rivers that feed into the bays, it turns the bay from a greenish clear to tannic. It'll be clear brown, but it will be brown. It will be clear. Um, that's a great color, that brown and tan combination with a little copper or gold flash. Those are great colors for when the um, water turns tannic in the, in the panhandle during the spring. And it usually clears up further in the summer. Another thing to think about is that's also a good fly for bass. If you get blown off the salt water, you can also use olive and tan, which is readily accessible for largemouth bass. The other thing don't rule out are really small clousers. This is a size six, I believe. Um, a size eight, a size six are good clousers in white, white and pink, white and chartreuse. Uh, this is electric ch chicken, green and pink, chartreuse and pink. They're great for small sea trout. They'll also catch crappy. They'll all ca also catch bass. They'll also catch big bluegill. They'll also catch catfish. And I'm speaking freshwater. They'll also catch a little snook. They'll catch baby tarpon. So you don't have to have a big fly. That's why I tell you, if you only have a fly, five weight fly rod, take your five weight fly rod, get you some little small clousers in size eights and sixes of different colors and you can still catch fish. Go maybe small lead eyes so it's easier to cast. Little clousers are a great bait um, in Florida. So another two flies in Florida I always take. Seducer and natural grizz for a shrimp imitation. And then a red and white seducer which you can use in salt water and you can also use in fresh water for bass. Now, some, um, another fly that is crossover, both freshwater and saltwater, you need to have some poppers. Um, if you take poppers with stainless hooks, like this one, you can use it in saltwater and freshwater. Poppers catch everything. They'll catch redfish, sea trout, snook, tarpon, largemouth bass, small poppers. Like this, will catch all different kinds of panfishes, swanee bass, um, small largemouth bass. Actually, these little small pops like this will also catch baby tarpon under 24 inches and they'll catch sea trout. Easy to throw with a five weight. This, of course, would be something you want to throw with a seven weight, nine weight, eight weight. But that stainless hook, you can use it both fresh and salt. Um, you need to have something that looks like a crab. This is just a basic crab pattern. Nothing specific. It's got legs. It's got an EP brush body. Just take you uh, take some crabby looking flies and natural colors can't go wrong. Um, another top water that is used all over Florida is a slider. It's got a foam body, uh, a gurgler. I'm sorry, not a slider. Sorry, a gurgler. It's got a foam top, either synthetic or bucktail. Chanel body, some little rubber legs. A gurgler. A gurgler is good for bass. It's good for snook. It's good for baby tarpon. Um, it's good for redfish, it's good for sea trout, it's good for anything. Um, they use this in the Everglades a lot because certain times of years, the snook, um, when they're in the back country, in the cooler months, will also eat frogs, a lot of big frogs in the back country. So um, this gurgler, um, it also works on striped bass in the northeast in larger sizes. Gurgler is a great little fly, another topwater fly besides the popper. So you need to take... A shrimp pattern besides the seducers this is EP spawning shrimp you can buy it from EP online it's not that expensive 
just a little shrimpy looking buggy thing. Take one of those with you. Now getting um, into a little more specific, Central Florida through South Florida and on the west side of Florida, you need to have something, west side being Tampa down through Naples. They call them flats bunnies. You need to have something with a rabbit tail. Paralyte eyes, get it down. The body can be either EP fiber or some kind of brush. It could be chenille, but you ought to have something with a rabbit tail on it. This will catch black drum, redfish, sheephead, big ones, big ones will catch cobia. Um, but some kind of fly with a rabbit tail is really great. Now, some area specific flies. If you fish on the west coast from Tampa down through the west side of the Everglades, there's two flies that they really like for snook and tarpon and trout and just about anything else that swims. These are EP, um, these are EP minnows. You can buy these directly from any fly shop or from EP from his website. This is a pilcher. Um, the guys on the southwest coast of Florida swear by these all the way down through the Keys. Anywhere that water has a green tint, I think they work really well. And they call this um, Everglades SP. So this is a mandatory fly for the southwest coast of Florida. If you go in Tampa South, down through um, the east side of the Everglades and down through the Florida Keys, you need to have one of these. It can be in various sizes. This is a one. I went and picked up a three aught just to show you, show you all. Let me open up the bag. They just come in a regular bag. Eureka Pluvisi. These are not cheap. This big one's eight dollars. So use it wisely. You can all those tie. You can also tie these yourself if you tie. But this Everglades, this Everglades color combination, which looks like a pilcher, is a great fly, and it's a mandatory fly to have if you're fishing from Tampa down through the middle of the Everglades. So here's a big one, three aught. Here's a small one. Make sure you have one of these or two of these in your box when you go down the southwest coast of Florida. Another great fly, and this is anywhere from central Florida on the east coast down through the Everglades back up through Tampa, is the same fly but in the purple and black. This is a little one, good for baby tarpon. This is a big one, good for bigger tarpon. This also will catch snook. This is a great nighttime fly. Black silhouettes better at night than other colors. So if you're in real muddy water, not tannic, but muddy water, and you've got, um, you're at night with shadows, these are great flies. Um, tarpon see purple first, and then chartreuse second. There's a, what's more visible to a tarpon is chartreuse and then purple. Oh, excuse me, it's purple then chartreuse. Uh, when you talk to a marine biologist and they say what colors can tarpon uh, pick up easier, the purple is the first color they pick up in their uh, visual acuity, and then chartreuse is the second one. Um, another fly for the southwest coast of Florida from the beaches of Tampa down through the beaches of Naples is another Enrico Plugizi fly another one of his minnows, and it's a tiny little fly. Um, in the late spring, early summer, when the snook first push out onto the beaches, usually the smaller snook push first, and many times the bait on the beach in the early spring is very small. And the snook are small. These are snook that you could catch with a three-weight fly rod. They're that small. They're great fun. And this little fly lands very softly and I've tried using a chartreuse and white clouds around the beach on the beach at Naples a little bit bigger and they would not tolerate the sound of those lead eyes hitting the water spooked them and I'm, when I'm talking about on the beach I'm talking about these fish were whoops three feet off the beach two feet off the beach where the water ends on the beach they were sitting off in a little trough 
and there was little minnows right behind where the waves broke over directly on the dry beach and they'd run up and pick those minnows off and they would those minnows were actually this size and smaller and you can get these in this olive and white you can get it in uh, gray and white all white silver and white but this small with that big of an eye and you could throw this easily on a five weight fly rod um another place that this little fly is really good at in the spring from in the florida panhandle from port st joe over to um pensacola not as much in pensacola anymore because the seagrass die off but in the spring the pinfish um hatch out of the eggs so you have thousands of little pinfish in the seagrass in the bays and when you look over a boat and you look down to the bottom and see them it look like little dimes flashing in the water and you can throw a cast net and get them and the trout will just gorge themselves on those little pinfish because they're not big enough for their fins to get um very pronounced and sharp uh, adult pinfish have very sharp fins peck and uh had a, all their fins are sharp. Um, I guess why they call them pinfish. But when they're first born, the fins are still relatively soft. They're dorsal, they're pecs, they're anal fins. And this little fly in white and silver looks a lot like those little pinfish in the panhandle. And that's just a spring thing. It only happens in the spring. They're only that small for a few weeks, and then they get larger, of course. Um, this fly would not be as good in the fall when the pinfish are grown and larger but in the spring say march um it's a very distinct period and like i said you can be in a boat or a kayak and look over the side and you see all these little silver flashes look like little dimes down on the bottom this is a great fly um now i will tell you that in many parts of florida in the winter fish end up turning on and feeding on very small baits they end up on glass minnows they end up on um mollies baits that are this small or baits that are baits that are like this small or baits that are this small and this is just a joe brooks blonde you can't buy these in stores anymore years ago you could it's just bucktail with a mylar body and some more bucktail this is a size eight but literally you'll see in the winter in many areas in florida central and south florida fish eating mollies and rain baits and glass minnows that are this small and little sh deceivers excuse me little clousers and little joe books blondes that are chartreuse and white or this black and purple that are on size eight hooks will work they'll work on snook and trout and small tarpon and redfish and ladyfish and they will work on bluegills and crappy and largemouth bass and uh, red breast and they will also work on oscars and they will work on peacock bass they'll work on these little small baits in the winter will work on anything that swims because fish are very keyed into that small bait another bait for the southwest part of the state is they call it a schwimino it looks like and this is one that i tied it's peach and they use this for um uh, Peacock bass and Oscars in the Everglades because it kind of has the same color as the Mayan cichlid. It really looks like an old Mark Ocean blossom fly. It's got a marabou body, a marabou tail, um, Estes Grand for the body, and it's got bee chain eyes. Um, the two colors, peach for the Everglades where that brown water is, and then solid white. This can be tied to a number two hook down to a number eight hook um the number two in all white is a very popular snook fly along the coast from tampa down through naples especially when the bigger snook come up in the more predominant summer months when they come out and they're really on the beach feeding and spawning um, this is a great little fly like i said kind of looks like a woolly booger kind of looks like a mark sessions blossom fly it's just a few little things. Some of these have bee chains. Some of these have mono's eye, mono eyes on them. You can buy these on fly shops on the southwest coast of Florida. Um, I would not go home, go to Florida without one of these on the southwest side. So those are some of the flies that I take no matter where I go in Florida. 
and the specific flies for the southwest coast. Um, the south, uh, the southeast coast, you know, um, south central coast, central coast, northeast coast. You really, you know, if you've got clousers, deceivers, seducers, some kind of surface fly, a crab pattern, that's all you really need. These specific glades, minnows, they look like pilchards and this purple and black. You can take those with you if you're in, into your box. You don't need to buy those, especially for the Northeast. Um, there are tarpon in the panhandle of Florida in the summer. So, you know, these would be good, a good tarpon fly. Another fly that I take is just a good old spoon fly. It's not really a fly, but it was this Dupree spoon was invented in Florida. Make sure you take some of these with you in the panhandle. In the northeast section of Florida, when you fish in the flooded Spartina gra grass, this is a great fly. Um, it has a weed guard on it. I don't know if you can see that little weed guard. It has a weed guard on it. It's a great fly to take um, when you fish in the Spartina grass. Also, when you fish in the Spartina grass, a uh, crab fly with a weed guard. And you can do a more natural looking blue and green color, or you can do a brown color to look like a filler crab. The two colors I like in the northeast corner of the state in the Spartina glass grass would be a brown to look like a filler crab and then a blue-green to look like a blue crab. They do say that redfish see blue and green first in their visual acuity, like tarpon see purple first and then chartreuse second. Redfish pick up blue and green um, in their visual acuity. So it makes sense. I mean, they eat blue crabs. They make a living eating blue crabs, and they also make a living eating um, fiddler crabs. And fiddler crabs are brown, tan, and they have a little purple in them sometimes. Once again, if you're in the northeast corner of the state, chartreuse and white clouser, all white clouser, brown and tan clouser. Can't go wrong with those. Um, if you're in Florida... I always tell people to take some freshwater stuff with you. And freshwater fishing in Florida is pretty simple. The same poppers you use, the same seducers, red and white seducer, popper, um, anything with a rabbit strip off the back, purple, black, olive. Anything like that will work in the freshwater for bass. Gold spoons will work for bass down there. Um, little tiny clousers will work for a crappy bluegill, red breast, uh, any of your traditional trout flies, woolly booger and black, can't go wrong, woolly booger and olive, can't go wrong, and these also will work on Oscars. If you're down in South Florida, down in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, fishing for Oscars. Um, if you're a trout fisherman, if you get any prince nips with a bead head, they'll work. Prince nips will work. Any of your standard trout nips and size 10, 8, 10s, and 12s, your bigger ones. And of course, a little popper with rubber legs always works. Can't go wrong. Um, rubber legs are much more important in freshwater than saltwater. This little gargler, the original gargler didn't have rubber legs on it, the one that Jack Garside invented. Um, and this was store bought. This little gargler with the rubber legs is good in saltwater and freshwater. You can use this one fly, it's got a stainless hook. You can use this one fly in both places, so it serves double duty, which makes it easy when you have to travel down. Now let's talk about some ancillary items. We talked about some flies, we talked about fly, fly rods, fly lines. I'm gonna talk about fly lines first. Um, if you have a five weight and it has a standard trout line on it, that's probably not gonna work real well in Florida, especially in the warmer months. It might work in the winter if for fresh water. So, there are some companies, Cortland's one, makes a 5-6 weight fly line, Tropic Plus Series, made for hot to warm weather, hot to warm water. This is a Tropic Compact. It's 5-6 to six weight. It's 200 grains. So you remember when we talked about fly lines video, which is a long video, kind of tedious. Um, a 200 grain fly line by the AFFTA standard is really almost an eight weight fly line. Because the eight weight fly line by AF 
FTA standards is 202 grains. Now that might be AFFT by the first, um, that's for the first 30 feet. So this 200 grains, I don't know if it's for the first 30 feet or if it's for the first 30 feet plus the running line. Um, the running line is probably 70 feet. So if it's only for the first 30 feet, then this would not be an eight weight fly line. Excuse me, if this 200 grains was just for the first 30 feet, it would be almost an eight weight fly line. It'd be a heavy seven weight. If this um, fly line was 200 grains for the head and the running line, then it would be more like a five, six or seven fly line. The main thing is you could take this Tropic Plus fly line in a five, six in your five weight fly rod, take the trout taper you have off and then put this on and use it all over Florida. And you could use it in freshwater and saltwater, and it would throw a fairly decent sized fly too. Um, if you have a softer action or slower action or moderate action fly rod, like a G2, Scott G, and the old Scott G2s, or maybe you have one of the less expensive Echo five weight models that has a softer action, you might feel a little overpowered. But if you have um, an Orvis 5D, I probably wouldn't even throw this on a, a Sage 5X, the 5 weight X by Sage, even though it's a top end rod, it's a little bit slower. I wouldn't even throw it on that. I would save it to something that had a little more, a little more backbone to it, a little bit faster action. So get yourself a warm water fly line if you don't have one. If you take a cold water trout line out, um, you might not be happy with it, but this you can use anywhere. What else do you need? So you need a fly line that can tolerate the hotter temperatures. Uh, like I said, this Orvis 5D can easily handle that 200 grain fly line. Like I said, I wish it had a fighting butt, but it does have the little swell here. A full wells or a snub no, snub no wells. And then, you know, if you can take only two fly rods, it really depends on what you're going to do and where you're going to be. Um, there's a lot of folks on the west side of Florida, say from Tampa down through Naples who actually fish six weight fly rods because there's so much fishing pressure on the fish and they're really skittish So they go pretty light and the guys in the Everglades a lot of guides in the Everglades for peacock bass and largemouth bass They're only throwing six weight six weights some throw five some throw threes some throw six um, I do like the seven weight with the fighting butt we talked about that before um, If you're not gonna fish say the southwest corner for big snook around um, structure. So if you're going to fish the beach in the summer for snook um, or in the bays for trout and redfish, and then you might want to go to Everglades for peacock bass and mine cichlids and oscars, you probably could just get by with a five and a seven weight. If you're up in the panhandle um, or if you're going to fish for larger snook around docks and bridges at night, you're probably going to want a five and a nine weight or five and an eight weight, eight weight minimum. And it needs to be a eight weight with a lot of backbone because those big snook at night, if they're around any kind of docks or bridges at the light edge, when you hook them, they're going straight for that bridge or that dock and you got to turn them really fast or you're not going to turn them. They're just going to break you off. So having a stiffer rod with a lot of backbone at an eight weight helps. That's kind of why I like nine weights. It gives me a little more rod to turn that fish off the bridges and the um, docks. And there's a lot of snook in that southwest corner that hang around at night around bridges and docks. So the other thing too is um, as you go up into the panhandle, there's um, a lot of fishing pressure. Um, even after the storm, things are starting to come back to normal. And a six or a nine or a five and a nine or a six and an eight or a five and an eight is still not a bad combination. Now, realize that you could be fishing in the panhandle, whether it's in Panama City or Fort Walton, Destin area, or over in Pensacola. Realize you could be in the panhandle on one of the bays and catch a 10-inch trout on one cast and catch a 20-pound Jack Crevelli on the next cast. I've hooked fish in the Bay at Panama City that I couldn't turn. Um, catching 
slot size sea trout, which are, you know, don't fight that hard, and then hook something I just couldn't turn and it wasn't a stingray. Um, that's just the nature of saltwater fishing. Uh, we were down in Florida on the East Coast, Central Florida on the East Coast, and we were catching little ladyfish and sea trout and small snook under 16 inches and some baby tarpon. Could handle them with a five weight. All of a sudden, uh, almost 40 inch redfish showed up, sucking on little tiny minnows with the rest of the little fish. Not much you can do with him on a five weight. You can hook him. You might get him in or he might break you off. Another thing I want to point out too, so two manufacturers, Temple Fork Outfitter, and this is my nine weight Scott have come out with a new guide. It's a recoil guide, and it just bends, and then it bends back. TFO has this on one of their models, and um, Scott has this on their sector, which is their top-end saltwater model. I like this guide for traveling, because if it gets crushed over in the boat, or if you step on it on the ground, or something bad happens, the guide doesn't break, it just bends in place. It's a recoil guide. It's really nice. Now, they're loud. When your fly line goes through them, they're loud. But you don't have to worry about breaking a guide or the insert. There's no insert, no ceramic insert. So you don't have to worry about a ceramic insert popping out, which makes the guide useless. So these are kind of nice. Um, the Scott rod is very expensive. Um, the TFO rods that have this uh, recoil guide are um, more moderately priced. And like I said, if you're only buying a five and a nine weight and you only have a nine or an eight, whichever you prefer, you're only having one heavy rod in your quiver, you know, spending the money on these type guides if you travel a lot is very helpful. So I just want to show you all that. I think it's a good idea. So um, if I'm going to the Everglades or if I'm going to Central Florida, I'm probably taking a five or seven. If I think I'm going to do some snook fishing, heavy snook fishing, small tarpon fishing, small tarpon um, being over 30 inches, under 60 inches. I'm probably going to take a nine weight. I mean, ideally, if I'm if I'm driving down and I have unlimited room in my car, I take a five, seven, nine. Always take something light with you in case you get blown off the water, um, and you got to go fish fresh water if the wind gets too bad. I've had guides cancel on me because the wind was too high, 30 mile an hour plus wind. They're like, we can't go out on the boat. So then I had to go find somewhere else to fish. So always take a light rod with you to go do, keep yourself busy. Um, five, seven, nine is great. If you have just a six and an eight, that's great. If you have a four and an eight, that's great. If you have just an eight, just take your eight. Just take what you have and fish it. And um, start off with just a floating line and you'll do well. So other items that you need to take with you. You can take your hat with a bill, with a brim. Keep the sun off your face, out of your eyes. I like dark bottoms. I don't like the big round hats that some people wear. I wear them on the beach, but I don't wear them while I fish because I like to be able to look out the corner of my eye at my fly line and my back cast. So I still stick with a baseball hat, even though it doesn't offer a baseball style hat, even though it doesn't offer the most sun protection. Um, a buff. This is where I... This is where... If I'm not wearing one of those big brim round ghillie hats, if you have a buff, put it on the back of your head, over your ears, over your nose, so only this part is open, then you got your hat here. This makes up for the lack of shade protection by wearing a more traditional fishing baseball hat. Do not forget your buffs, even in the winter. January, February, March, take your buff, wear your buff. If you come from the upper Midwest, um, the Northeast, Maine, anywhere up there, Maine, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York. If you're coming from anywhere above Virginia or above the Northern California, take a buff. Wear your buff. The Dakotas, Montana, all those beautiful places, take a buff with you to Florida. If you don't want to wear a big floppy ghillie hat, those things irritate me. Plus, they blow off on the boat easier. Take a buff. Another thing to take is a pair of binoculars. Um, sometimes, and they don't have to be big binoculars, they don't have to be expensive binoculars. I prefer this little tiny pair here, easier to pack in my little backpack. Take some binoculars with you. Sometimes you have fish breaking and seagulls breaking 
outside of your vision and you need to take a look and see what's breaking if it's worth going to. Sometimes you just might want to look at some birds. Sometimes you might want to look at some wildlife. Um, I've seen Florida panther in Florida. I've seen black bear, panther, a lot more alligators than you can count. Um, all kinds of bird life. Take your little pair of binoculars, stick them in your backpack or your, hip, your uh, whatever, you, whatever you're using to carry your equipment. It doesn't hurt. Another thing is a headlamp. If you want to fish really, really early, it helps you have a headlamp. Um, I recommend that in the summer, whether you're in the Panhandle, going around the Big Bend, the Forgotten Coast, down through Tampa, Stenahatchee, all the way down to Naples, Marco Island, even into the Keys. Um, in the heat of the summer, generically everywhere in Florida except Jacksonville, which has tidal, a significant amount of tidal current, fishing is better in the cooler time of the day. Now, when you get into Amelia Island, Jacksonville, maybe headed down to St. Augustine, it's more tidal. And the fish respond more to the influence of the tide. If you go to Mia Island or Jacksonville, the marsh flats around there, Spartina grass marsh flats, when the tide floods in the summer months, the fish go up looking for filler crabs because the filler crabs have come out of hibernation. So fish in that area on that northeast coast are more tidal. Um, on the rest of Florida, just about, they just want moving water. They don't, they don't respond to incoming and outgoing tide as much um, in some areas when the tide dumps off the flat they're going to leave the flat they're going to go on to the flat but i still think in the hotter months fishing is better earlier so 5 a.m you got your head your headlight on and then in the winter months i think in just about all of florida except jacksonville may island Fernandina beach i think in the winter months the fishing is best the last two hours before dark Florida fish do not like cold weather. They don't like cold wind. They don't like cold rain. They don't like anything cold. Um, so in the winter months, you've got the water warms up all day and the fish become more active. And of course, you're fishing the last two hours before dark. So once again, you have your headlamp to get everything together at dark. So you've got binoculars. You've got a buff. You've got, of course, anywhere you go, you got to have your sunglasses, Polaroid sunglasses. I like big, nice, wide sunglasses that cover my entire eye and wrap around. I also like to have for them to have some kind of impact resistance. So if I take a clouser and bounce it off my sunglasses, it doesn't shatter and poke me in the eye. Uh, the inshore tint, bronze, they, they have a bunch of different colors or names for the color. A bronzy looking usually works best for inshore, bronze, rose, whatever they want to call it. There is a yellow sunglasses, yellow tinted, which are good for rainy days when it never the sun never comes out. I do have yellow lens sunglasses for early morning and for days that are rainy the whole day because when I go to Florida, it's always windy and it's always rainy. Just my luck. So I usually take yellow tint, a yellow tint, and then this inshore tint. You need a set of pliers. I like pliers that have cutting jaws. A good set of pliers. Majority of fish in saltwater have some kind of teeth. You don't want the teeth eating your thumb. So cutting jaws, pliers, good set. And for smaller saltwater fish, if you're a trout guy, you can actually take your forceps. Like these have the cutting jaws in them. They have a hook eye cleaner. These are also good to take if you're going to end up in freshwater one day. I actually take, when I go to Florida, I take both. These make these work a little bit better on like size eight and size ten flies, and they work much better when if you had to go fish saltwater and you should catch a small bass and uh, panfish species. So I take both. Do not stick your hand in fish in Florida. Bluefish, sea trout, flounder, snook don't have teeth. Redfish really don't have teeth. They have crushers in the back of the throat, but a lot of other things in Florida in the water have teeth. So don't. Just don't arbitrarily think you can put a thumb on every fish like you can bass. So another thing, I was talking to a gentleman. Sorry, I'm looking. I'm leaning over again. I was talking to a gentleman 
on in Cherokee on Abaco Island. My wife and I went over to do some vacation, some fishing. We had been to the Bahamas. We said, we're going to go to the Bahamas. So that was our vacation for the year. And I was talking to a gentleman, and he um, was fishing on the Oceanside Flat without a kayak. Sorry, I'm not looking. I'm getting things arranged. And I had told him that we had seen a lemon shark. We were at a bay, uh, a bay above him. He was in Cherokee Sound. We are in the next sound north of him by Pete's Pub. And I told him that we had seen a, a lemon shark that was acting unusually aggressive. And this was in March. The water was still a little chilly. And I said he was tracking us. I said I had seen one bonefish and he was kind of, he was hunting in the shallow water and tracking us and I think he picked up our scent. And what I ended up doing is taking my wife's spinning rod with a quarter ounce jig and I bounced it off his head basically because he was just getting a little too close to my likes. And I wasn't going to let him get close enough to hit with a paddle because we were out of the kayak um, waiting. We were in a tandem kayak and we were waiting looking for bonefish. And, of course, I was telling my wife to get back in the kayak. And she goes, oh, is that, that lemon shark's not that big. I said, he's big enough. Um, so I bounced, a, I bounced a quart ounce jig head off his head, and he took off. Thank goodness. But then I was talking with a gentleman who owns a fly shop in the Midwest, and he'd been coming to um, Abaco Island for a number of years and um, renting a place in the little village of Cherokee so he could fish the Oceanside Flats at Cherokee. And he said he had a big lemon shark probably seven foot come up on him and actually charged him and he had to take his fly rod and beat the lemon shark off and I'm like you have kayaks right there at the house you're running he goes oh yeah I said why didn't you take a kayak and take it with you and if you weren't fishing out of it tie it off to your waist and then if a shark got close worst case you know, you either jump in the kayak or you take the paddle because I had cheap solid paddles take the paddle and hit the shark with a paddle or jump in the paddle, jump in the kayak. He said, yeah, I really didn't think about that. I said, I wonder if it's because it's early in the season and they're hungry, they're more aggressive than they usually should be. He said, I don't know, and we talked about it for a while. And I thought about it. And I've had a number of close encounters with sharks and stingrays and alligators, grizzly bears, and other things. And I just, I'm to a point now where I try to be a little more intelligent about what I do. So... There are places in the Florida I will not wade. I will not wade fish at all. Period in the story. Not even an option. Uh, that would be Central Florida, say from St. Augustine down through Biscayne Bay, down through the Keys, um, across the Everglades. I will. I will walk the beaches on Southwest Florida and fish for snook on the beaches. I will not wade any of the sounds or backcountry in that part of Florida. Um, same way up through Tampa, the Nature Coast, the Big Bend area. Um, there are some places in the Panhandle that I know that I've since I lived there several years. I've been fishing there over twenty. There's some places in the Panhandle, Panama City. Um, Destin that I'll wade, but the areas in Florida that I will wade are very small. Um, there are some places on around Amelia Island um, where they have some marsh flats that are are firm, Spartina grass marsh flats that I would wade, but you got to get a boat to get to them, and you can only wade them on incoming tides. So I thought about it, and even in the areas that I wade, I said, you know, you really ought to carry something if you're going to wade. And I've talked to a friend of mine who still lives in Panama City, and he fishes conventional. And when he fishes conventional, he puts a sand spike out like you'd use on the beach. And he um, puts a sand spike out and uses it to hold his rod if he's changing um, lures or if he takes two rods. And um, he's had to take the sand spike and pop sharks in the head who got too close to him when he was wading. And he's only wading in mid, mid thigh water. So started thinking about a lot I said you know if you're gonna wade <clears throat> so you're in the panhandle you got some nice sandy firm bottom <coughs> excuse me you ought to carry something 
to keep animals from getting too close to you. And I'm specifically talking about sharks and alligators. And it's not that you can kill an animal with one of these. This is a fold of staff, original weighting. It's metal. Um, I recommend if you're going in the panhandle and you're going to do some weighting, that you carry something like this. Uh, if you go in other areas of Florida and you decide you want to wade fish, I don't recommend it and use extreme caution. Don't wear shorts. Don't wear open toe sandals. There's jellyfish, man of war jellyfish. There's blue crabs who can pinch you. There's um, stingrays who can pop you. There's sharks who can give you a bite. There's alligators who give you a bite. Down in Everglades, there's saltwater crocodiles that can give you a bite. But at least with this metal wading staff, you can tie it off to your tie it off to your belt loop, and it folds up so you can carry it on the aircraft, right? At least this is metal; it's firm. And if a shark gets too close to you, or if an alligator gets too close to you, um, it's got a pointed end. You can give them a jab and keep them off of you. Um, as I told the gentleman over in the Abacos, who were, he was in the village of Cherokee, I said, a fly rod is not a self-defense weapon. Um, but this at least, if you have a small shark who wants to come up and take your fish off your fly for you, or if you have a small shark, you know, you catch a fish, you wipe that fish slime on your hands, you wet your hands, but you still get a little fish slime on your hands, you wipe it on your pants, then you got fish slime on you. Um... Same thing for walking the beaches in the summer. This will also give you just a little bit to get the shark off of you. And like I said, it folds up, which is nice. It means you can transport it on the aircraft. Now, if you're driving, if you just want to take a wooden stick that's five feet long and use a wooden stick with the end on it, that's fine. But I just think you need to carry something that you can get yourself poke at the whatever and get them off of you because you just don't ever know um, animals have a mind of their own and I can tell you when I was in Central Florida fishing the St. John's we went to one corner and there was 24 alligators sitting on that corner and the smallest one was 4 foot and the biggest one was over 12 and my friend's like let's get out and walk the bank I'm like no let's not I'm like, you know, let's not go and push our luck. So, highly recommend if you're going to Florida, take you a wooden, do not take one of those fiberglass or composite graphite walking sticks or wading staffs that bend or flex. You need metal, sharp tip metal, or you need wood, something that's not going to give. And just drag it behind you. Then if you have to, something gets too close to you, a gator or a shark gets too close to you, you can give them a little jab with it. But only when they get too close to you. Don't pre don't go around and poking the don't poke the bear, as they say. Now another thing too. If you're in Florida, there will be alligators. I don't care if you're near salt water or fresh water. There's alligators there. I've seen it in the alligators in pure salt water. I've seen alligators swimming right behind me and seen six foot black tips under the alligator. So don't think that if you're in salt water, there's no alligators. Um, I do not, I have not seen alligators off the beaches, although they have pictures of them off the beaches in South Carolina. Um, I do know that where I grew up in Georgia, on the coast of Georgia, that in the warmer months when we have a lot of rain, there's a lot of big alligators in the marsh. They come out of the rivers, the freshwater rivers, come out in the marsh to look for food. There's more food in the salt water in the summer months than there is in the freshwater. Big mullet, other types of fish, crabs. So if you're in Florida, there's alligators. If you're in any part of Florida, there's sharks. Now in northern Florida, Jacksonville, um, the panhandle of Jacksonville, in the winter months, there's less sharks. In the summer months, and summer would be March, April through, I don't know, November. There's lots of sharks. People don't even realize how many sharks there are in Florida. Uh, New Smyrna Beach, people get, surfers get bit by bull sharks over there all the time. Um, 
It's just the risk of surfing there. So that goes back to carrying a metal wading staff or wind stick. If you're in Florida, there's sharks in the salt water. And if you're in some of the Florida freshwater rivers, there's bull sharks. If you're in any kind of water in Florida, there's probably alligators. If you have a dog, you see a lot of people out west take their dogs in the drift boats with them, or they take their dogs walking down the bank. Um, if you're in Florida and you take your dog fishing, be prepared to lose that dog to an alligator. Uh, an alligator will run you over to get to your dog. It is not safe for small children to be around alligators. Small children do not intimidate alligators. They look small. If you're in the water swimming and the alligator's on the surface of the water, he only sees your head. You kind of look like a funny goose or a funny looking duck. He doesn't know what you are. And there's a good chance if he's a full grown alligator, say anything over eight feet, he's going to bite you or try to bite you because he didn't realize you're human if you're swimming in the water. So keep small children close to you in different parts of Florida. Florida is a it's really wilderness. I mean, it's a little deceiving because Florida is the third most populated state. But when you look at the flora and the fauna, Florida is just as wild, especially when you look at south of Orlando. Um, if you're going east out of Orlando over to 520, over the 528, 520, over to the Space Coast where NASA is, going west over to Homosassa Springs, down through the Everglades, that is wild country. It's deceivingly wild. Yeah, there's a lot of population around different areas, but there's still some places there that have Florida panthers, wild hogs, snapping turtles, cottonmouth, water moccasins, rattlesnakes, alligators, black widow spiders, bull sharks. Um, Biscayne Bay is real sharky. The Florida Keys is real sharky. I don't wade those areas. I'll get in a kayak and fish and then look. Uh, the Everglades has saltwater crocodiles. The American crocodiles is, is still in the Everglades. So um, it's just as dangerous in certain parts of Florida as it would be in Montana or Wyoming with the grizzly bears, the black bears, uh, the buffalo. You know, uh, a lot of people get killed by moose in the Northeast and up through Alaska. So just because you're in the Sunshine State and there's lots of people and the beaches are beautiful, there's still a lot of things down there that can bother you or can hurt you. And the goal on vacation is to go vacation, have a good time, kiss some fish, and not end up in a short hospital visit that just ruins your vacation. So maintain your situational awareness. Realize that if you're in water in Florida, there's alligators, probably sharks, and um, keep your eye out. Don't take your dogs by the water when you go fishing. Ask them for trouble. Good chance you'll lose your dog. The other thing, too, is there's a lot of people who I listen to on podcasts who ask about, well, what kind of music do you listen to when you fish? And there's a lot of people, I guess, they go fly fishing in the western streams and they have on their earbuds and they're listening to music. Don't do that in Florida. You need to use your ears to listen for things. And the things you need to listen for are shrimp popping, um, fish being chased, showering, uh, birds. And birds can either be um, feeding or birds could be warning about a predator. I was fishing in Panama City. I was wade fishing in an area that um, has good sand firm, has good firm sand bottom. I did not have a wading staff with me. I was just um, going down the bank early in the morning. And there was a great blue heron, and I was sitting there standing casting, and all of a sudden he started squawking really loud, and he went straight up into a tall pine tree. Now, great blue herons, many times when you upset them, they'll fly off a greater distance, and they'll get away from you. He just went straight up in the pine tree, and he is constantly squawking. He didn't stop. Um, a lot of times they'll go fly to another area, land, and start fishing again, and they won't talk. And I said, well, something's wrong because he's constantly talking. And so I just happened to turn around and about 75 yards behind me was a six foot alligator just coming slowly down, trailing me behind, trailing behind me. Only six feet, probably looking for a free meal, you know, saw me fishing. And I was only in 
mid-shin water. I wasn't in really deep water because the tide was high, really high that day, so I didn't have to wade out that deep, which I don't like wading deep anyways. But he was probably trailing me looking for a free meal. But that bird was fussing at that warning the alarm about the alligator. I wasn't mad about me because I went by the bird. The bird didn't move out of that big, tall pine tree, and he kept fussing even after I had gotten past him and was down the bank some, and the alligator was basically in front of him. So he was fussing about that alligator because alligator weed a wading bird. So listen to the birds. You'll listen to birds diving on bait, crashing bait. But, you know, sometimes you'll listen to birds squawking about alligators or other predators, usually just alligators. Um, I also had another um, experience in the Everglades. I was fishing the canal that runs along uh, Tamiami Trail, Highway 41, where I was fishing. I had parked my truck in a pull-off that was wide enough for about four cars, and it went to a, a piece of government property that had a chain-link fence and a gate locked over the front of it, and it was right before dark. And there were some wading birds behind me, fish popping around, and so I was fishing, and wasn't catching anything, throwing the fly, throwing the fly, throwing a five weight. And I said, you know, I just felt like something was watching me. And I had, I turned around and there was eight or nine foot gator on the other side of the pull off in the ditch over there. Cause the ditch had a culvert under the pull off and he was easing up towards me. And when I turned around, I saw him and put up my arms real high to make myself look bigger. And he took off and went, I don't know where he took off and went. I don't know if he went into the culvert. I don't know if he went down the other away from me in the ditch. But I had positioned my truck where I could get to the truck without having to go across any open space or near that water on the other side. Basically, the ditch I was fishing in, I turned around and could go straight back to my truck. I didn't have to go across the entire pullout to get to my truck. Um... But at that time, there was over a half dozen wading birds in the trees um, hitting fish, you know, fishing. And not one of them squawked at that alligator. I don't know if he was moving too slow for them to pick him up or they see the alligator so often that it doesn't bother him anymore like it did that, um, that great blue heron up in the panhandle. But they didn't say a word. They just kept fishing. And I'm like, well, they're brave because that alligator could have snatched one of them off the branch. So, you know, sometimes you get warned, sometimes you don't. Always check behind you especially early in the morning, late in the evening. Um, maintain your situational awareness. And, I, you know, thinking about alligators and sharks, I did have a guide friend who lives in Naples. She actually has a, she has a toilet Tacoma with an open bed. She doesn't have a camper shell. That's just the bed's open. She hauls kayaks in it. Well, there was two male alligators who got into a territorial fight right by where she was fishing and they were on the right side of the back of the truck and she was on the left side so she was able to jump up into her truck but those two males they were both over eight feet long they got to fighting and they weren't after her but they started off on the right side of the truck fight 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 roll fight fight ended up around the back of the truck if she had been on the right side of the truck instead of the left side of the truck she couldn't have jumped in the truck in the bed of the truck and you know depending on which way they roll the last thing you want to do is be caught where you can't get to your vehicle. You got two male gators fighting over territory and they end up rolling up on top of you. That's bad. And you think, well, that crazy things like that never happen. But if you spend enough time out in the nature in Florida or in the South, crazy things like that happen. So, you know, always maintain your situation awareness. Always be think thinking about where you park your vehicle and how you can get back to your vehicle without being cut off by an animal, whether it's a panther or a black bear or an alligator. You know, if you're on any of the beaches in the warmer months, look at the troughs. Most beaches have a trough that drops off, then a sandbar, then another trough. You know, when you get out past the second trough, it usually drops way off and big bull sharks run out there. But in the late afternoon, those big bull sharks will run the troughs. You know, don't fish in the troughs with cut bait in your pocket or smelling of bait or smelling of fish. Um, so just keep your eye out because there's some stuff down there that can hurt you if you're not used to being in that environment. Um, you know, it's just like you don't go to Montana and walk through the back country without bear spray or a weapon or, you know, making some kind of noise because there's grizzly, grizzly bears and black bears out there and they can dust you up pretty good too. Same with Alaska. So 
those are the things I think you need to go to Florida. One last thing we'll talk about leaders. We talked about fly line, just to wait for it floating. Leaders can be very simple. You can take six foot of 40, two foot of 30, two foot of 20, and just tie those together and make a leader for any of your saltwater needs. You can make the butt section six foot or five foot or four foot. You can, you know, some guys just do a wingspan of the 40, half a wing of 30, half a wing of 20, just that simple. You can um, buy pre-made leaders, you know, you can buy fluorocarbon if you're fishing things that are sinking. These are nine foot, 10 foot Orvis. You know, if you're fishing in ditches or you're fishing for largemouth bass, a seven and a half foot, 20 pound liter, seven and a half foot is a fine. If you're fishing, you know, you can go down to 12, nine foot 12, nine foot 10. It doesn't have to be 20. If you're fishing for, if you get caught on a bad day and you got to fish fresh water and you're throwing your five weight, so you got your five and your seven or your five and your eight and your five and your nine with you, you know, you can go down to a standard trout leader, seven and a half foot, six foot, 6.4 pound, 4X. You can go down to a 4X, 5X, 3X, yeah, four, five or, uh, four, five or three, three, four or five X. You can go down to something like that to throw some little buggers or some little poppers. Or some little tiny clousers. I mean, it's not, it doesn't have to be sophisticated. But just take a variety with you. Take a couple of each. Like I said, if you get blown off the water because it's winds blowing 35 miles an hour, you don't want to just sit there and not fish. So go fish for something. So that's it. If you go to Florida, enjoy it. Have a great time. There's still some good fishing left down there. Um, it's not what it used to be, but nothing is. Um, be careful. Where you go, there's stingrays, sharks, alligators. You don't have to fear them, but respect what they can do. Uh, take a wading, metal wading staff or wooden wading staff, depending if you're driving. Take a five, a seven, a nine. Take a five and an eight. Take a six and a nine. If you're going down to the Keys, um, most places, if you're getting a guide, if you want to go tarpon fishing, most guides will have heavier rods on their boat. We talked about that earlier, about how many rods you really need. Um, you don't need... 14 rods you can go to florida with an eight weight and then if you want to fish for tarpon call a guide and say hey i want to fish for tarpon and do you have the rods i need and he'll say yeah uh, more likely so um, that's why they charge what they charge they gotta pay for the boat they gotta pay for their equipment they gotta pay for their vehicle and um you're paying for their time and so don't be afraid to use a guide tip generously take a hook file keep the hook sharp we talk about that all the time Always take a hook file with you of some sort. Keep your hooks sharp. Don't fish with all hooks. Check them. If you jump one tarpon, I'm trying to get my hook file out. If you jump one tarpon or hook one redfish, sharpen that hook because tarpon have very hard mouth and they're all point of a hook. So that's my tips for going to Florida. Um, go down have a good time. If you're going on vacation with the family, it's easy to sneak in a couple hours of fishing here and there. Be open to fishing freshwater and saltwater. Um, in South 40, you can catch all kinds of exotics, peacocks, oscars, mine cichlids, snakeheads, all kind of fun stuff down there if you get blown off the water. Clown knife fish, it's uh, very interesting. So uh, keep your hooks sharp. Have a great weekend and have a good time. Thanks. <laughs>